This first little door that you have with the PD on it, we're going to write out here that this is point discontinuity. Point discontinuity. And then underneath that, we're going to write radi, R-A-T squared. E Y, because this is also kind of the title for the whole thing. PD Rady is what it's called. Now I have a had a colleague that's uh, no longer here would call this ratui, and it never made sense to me. It always sounded like the mouse, like ratatouille. I don't know where she's getting that from. Finally occurred to me, rat to e. Great, but I still just think Rady is fine. And that's just an acronym that's going to help us make sure we have all of the information we need for our rationals. So nothing in this foldable should be brand new information. It's all stuff that we've already talked about together, and we're just kind of organizing it all in one thing, right? So if you open that little door, this is what you have inside your first little door here. And, oh, I lost mine, that's okay. I know what, oh, there we go. Um, so this is point discontinuity. We're just gonna write it again. point discontinuity, which means that we have a hole, okay, also known as a hole, or as removable discontinuity. Just abbreviate the disc. So removable and point discontinuity, same thing. You're just basically taking a point out of the graph. Just remove it right away. So to find our holes or our point discontinuity, we have factors containing x that are common to the numerator and denominator. Okay. They are common to the numerator and denominator. That's why we get to cancel them out, right? Like I said. No brand new information. We good with that? That's our point discontinuity. Alrighty, so then the R in Rady stands for roots or zeros. I guess we could have called it ZD, but roots, zeros, we should know that those are the same thing. So when we open that little door up, Roots are the x-intercepts. And where do we find them? In the numerator or the denominator? Numerator. They are the zeros of the numerator. So the zeros of the function itself comes from the zeros of the numerator. And do we do these before or after we reduce? They are found after reducing. You have to get rid of the possible holes first so that you're not using something that's incorrect. Okay? Everybody with me so far? We good? All right. So then we go to the A part here. The A would be asymptotes and but they're only the vertical ones for now. Oops, only the vertical asymptotes. Horizontal and slant will come in to play later. If I have a vertical asymptote or more than one, then this is a unique factor containing x. And where do these come from, numerator or denominator? Denominator. Where's your phone supposed to be? Which one is that? Thank you very much. 
All right, unique, and it's unique. That means after we cancel it out, then it's still there. That's why it's unique to the denominator. And um, what I want you to make sure that you remember is that all of the asymptotes that we are talking about are lines so that we have to write them as equations of lines. And these are determined by these zeros of the denominator. zeros of the denominator. Everybody good so far? Questions? Again, not brand new information, right? <clears throat> All right, so then the t squared. This is two things, and those two things both start with t. Let me just put two things there. So I've got to determine, or do any of the factors of R or A, so remember these are our roots, these are our vertical asymptotes, and the R part comes from the numerator, A part comes from the denominator, right? So do any of the factors of either one of them have an even exponent? Now, not just do I have an X squared, but does the factor, the X minus three squared, or the x plus 7 squared, like the factor itself have an even exponent. So when we do here, if I have one in the numerator, that is what gives me tangency. Okay, tangency. And we're going to draw two little pictures to go with that. Your tangency is where it bounces off the x-axis at a zero. It can either bounce up or bounce down, but is positive, it bounces, it stays positive. That's where you get your tangency from. Okay? If I have a factor with an even exponent in the denominator, this is what gives me togetherness. Okay? So this gives me tangent, I'm looking for tangency or togetherness. The tangency has to do with the zeros, and we bounce it as zero. The togetherness come, has to do with the asymptotes, and the asymptotes come from the denominator, the zeros come from the numerator. And we're going to draw three little pictures here. And then let's see, put in some asymptotes. So what togetherness means graphically is that on either side of the asymptote, the function would either be going, they'd be going in the same direction, either both going to infinity or both sides going to negative infinity. And then I want you to draw this. That is not togetherness. So we're going to put a circle with a line through it because it's good to have on your notes sometimes what things aren't. Okay, they're going in opposite direction. That is not togetherness. So tangency, togetherness. That's how you know if you have these things. Okay, what questions you got about that? The togetherness, kind of new. I don't know that I've ever talked about it that way, but we've looked at it at least. <clears throat> Very good. All right, so then we have the E, which is end behavior. And we have looked at end behavior with limits. So basically, the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x would equal something. And same for negative infinity, but it's way out at the ends at the infinities. So this is where our other asymptotes come into play because vertical asymptotes have to do with middle behavior, but horizontal asymptotes, that is our end behavior. So my horizontal asymptote, which we could label as HA for horizontal asymptote, 
we look at our function and ask ourselves if it's top heavy, bottom heavy, or tied in degree. If my function is top heavy, tell me about the horizontal asymptote. What? There isn't one, right? If it's top heavy, there's none. If it's bottom heavy, tell me about the asymptote. Y equals zero. Very good. I heard Y equals. It's a line. Y equals zero. Very good. And if they are tied in degree, what do you find? The ratio. Good. So tied in degree would be Y equals the ratio. And then I put in the rest for you so you don't have to write it all down. Of the leading coefficients of the numerator and denominator. I guess I did leave out the word of the, of the numerator and denominator. Okay. Slant asymptote we can say is SA. So if I'm, the, my function is top heavy, it opens the door for it to possibly be a slant asymptote, but I can only have a slant asymptote if the degree of the numerator is how much more? One. It is one more than the degree of the denominator. We divide and ignore the remainder. Or we don't have to officially divide. We can just look at the ratio of the, the leading terms and get a line that our slant asymptote will be parallel to. That at least tells us end behavior. OK, and then we have other end behavior. So like, what happens if it's more than 1? If the degree of the numerator is more than, more than 1 higher than the denominator, it has polynomial end behavior. The truth is it has that even with this. That's what a slant asymptote is. But it's polynomial end behavior. This is how we got our, like, our quadratic asymptote. right? And if I don't need to know exactly what the actual asymptote is, I just need to know what's happening with the end behavior. I just divide the leading terms. Divide leading terms. To, to, fig to figure out what it is. So I can figure out if it's you know, up, down, down, if they're opposite, whatever. This isn't something, the other end behavior isn't something you're going to be tested on. It's just something that I want you to know exists, and it's not all just about horizontal and slant asymptotes. Okay? What questions you got? Well, good? All right, so then the last thing we have is this y, and that is for the y-intercept. And that is singular because you can only have one y-intercept. If you have more than one y-intercept, then you are not a function. Okay. And we know that the y-intercept occurs when? When x equals 0, right? So that means I substitute 0 in for x and solve for y. Or if it's in function notation, I'm finding f of 0, or g of 0, or h of 0, whatever. And when you find that, it is written as an ordered pair. Okay. What questions do you have? Anything? All right, so just keep that handy. I'm going to give you your second page. You have that there's a little reference here. All right, on the back of Rady, you can put that that is going on page 38. And then what I just gave you is going on page 39. OK, so this is equivalent representation. So we're going to see that we have an equation, we have a graph, we have words, just different ways we can represent the same function. So we are recalling once again. And it's wording like this that blows your little mind sometimes, but it can't because you're going to have wording like this and you can't just read it and go, I don't have a clue. You've got to make some sense of it. So we're going to let h of x equal f of x over g of x, which means I have a rational function. 
Then it says if g of c equals 0, so if the denominator equals 0, when I substitute in some number, like for instance, if it said g of 5 equals 0, c is just a number, <clears throat> if that's the case, then the function overall has a vertical asymptote or a hole at x equals c. So if g of 5 equals 0, then I either have a vertical asymptote or a hole at x equals 5. That's all it's saying. Okay? And sometimes those words in a question are important because it's trying to get you to understand what you're supposed to be doing there. All right, let's look at example 1. <clears throat> so I have this function. It says I'm going to write, the, write an equation for h of x in factored form and find any x values where we have a hole or a vertical asymptote. Okay, so I need to factor this. When I factor the numerator, that factors into what? Good, x plus 2, x minus 2. Then in the denominator, 10 is positive, so the signs are the same. 7 is positive, so it's plus plus. What are my numbers? 5 and 2. So you need to be able to factor accurately and efficiently like that. Just be able to, you don't have time forever to factor. <clears throat> All right. And so, do I have a hole anywhere? Yes, because I can cancel this out, which means I have a hole at x equals what? Negative 2. Okay. And it only asked me for the x value here, so I'm good. Then my reduced function would be x minus 2 over x plus 5. So then I have a one vertical asymptote at x equals what? negative 5. Then we are asked to find the domain from this same example. So the domain of a rational, it is all real numbers except for anywhere you have a vertical asymptote or a hole. So if I know these two things, I don't actually need to look at a function. I don't need to look at a graph. I can write it from this. I know I started negative infinity. I get to use all of the x values till I come up on negative 5. I don't get to actually make it to negative 5 because there's a vertical asymptote there, so I have to skip over him. Then I'm on the other side of that asymptote. I can use everything from negative 5 until I come upon negative 2. I can't use negative 2 because there's a hole there, but I can get real I can get right up to it. I gotta skip over him, and then I can go from negative 2. To infinity. So if I have two of these total, right, man, because I could have multiple asymptotes, I could have multiple holes, but overall I have two things that are going to mess it up. I need two of these little union signs, and then I'm just skipping right over those things. Easy enough? We're good? That's how you find your domain. All right, let's look at example three. So I have tells me I'm going to write an equation. Okay, so write an equation for k of x in factored form. So k of x equals numerator, we're going to factor into x plus 3 times x minus 4. And the denominator, I can factor out an x. You can't forget this guy that you just factored out. And then this would give me x plus 5 times x minus 4. Then we're going to write down PD radi. So we can make sure that we find all of this stuff that we know we can find. Because in the end here, we're going to have to graph this. And we need all of that information to make sure our graph is as accurate as we can get it. So the first thing it asks me for are any zeros, but is that really the first thing I look for? No. First thing I look for is the holes, right? And this is where this asks me for this. So this is PD right here. So I can mark this off. And I know I can cancel this, which means I have a hole at x equals 4. We agree with that? Okay. And then let me write out my reduced function here. K of x equals x plus 3 over x times x plus 5. Okay. 
And then after that, you don't necessarily have to go in the order of the word, but you might as well, so we don't lose anything here. So the zeros, that would be the R part of Rady, right? How many zeros do I have or roots? One, right? X equals what? Negative three. And then vertical asymptotes, that's the A part. How many vertical asymptotes do I have? Two. So I've got X equals zero, don't forget about him, and X equals negative five. Then horizontal asymptotes, that's going to be related to my end behavior, right? So do I have a horizontal asymptote? And what would it be? Be at y equals what? Zero. Good, because it is bottom heavy. So this is at y equals zero. Then I need to find the domain. So remember, the domain, when I'm doing this, I'm looking at the... Um, the holes and the vertical asymptotes, because those are what the that, those are what x cannot be. So I'm looking at this and this. There are a total of three things, right? Which means I need three little u's as I go through this. <clears throat> I start off at negative infinity. I get to use all of the x's until I get to negative five. Skip over that guy. Then I go from negative five to zero. Skip over that guy, and I go from 0 to 4. Skip over that guy, and I go from 4 to infinity. Okay? Because these are where these things happen, but it's also what x cannot equal on your function. Everybody with me so far? All right, so then when I look at this here, I haven't talked about tangent. There's not anything here that asks me about this because you're not always going to have just all this stuff listed out for you. <clears throat> Does this function have any tangency or togetherness? No, there's no factors that have a, <clears throat> an even exponent, right? So none of that. Y-intercept, that would be k of 0. k of 0 would be 3 over 0 times 5. What does that give me? 3 over 0, which is undefined. <clears throat> yeah, it's not 0. It's undefined. <clears throat> so I don't even have one. All right, so now I want to try and graph this stuff. Well, if I want to try and graph it, even though it only asked me for the x value of the whole, I really need to know what the y value is, too, so that I can plot the point. So the way I find the y value for the whole is to evaluate the x value in the reduced function here. So this would be 4 plus 3 over 4 times 4 plus 5. 4 plus 3 is 7. That would be 9 times 4, which is 36. And then I cannot reduce that. All right. So my ordered pair is 4 and 7 36. Now, in order for me to graph it, I really kind of need to know like an estimate of that. If that was 7 over 35, wouldn't you reduce to 1 fifth? So it's about one-fifth, which is probably the best we need on a little tiny graph like this. We can't get that accurate anyway. But at least you know it's not at three or at five or something like that. So we're going to plot these things. So I know that I have a zero at negative three. And I know I have a hole at, what was it, four, four and about a fifth. One, two, three, four. Okay, mine's more of an oval, but otherwise you can't tell that I made a hole. All right, then I also know that I have asymptotes. I have a vertical asymptote at negative five, and I have one at zero, and I have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. And that horizontal asymptote goes right through that zero at negative three which is fine. We can cross a horizontal asymptote. We cannot cross a vertical asymptote. Okay, now that's really all I have. I do know some other things, though I know what has to happen around my asymptotes. Don't draw this because I'm going to erase it. 
I know that on the right side of this asymptote, I either have to be going to infinity or negative infinity. That makes sense? Like it has to be one of those two because that's the way it works. So that means the graph either looks like this or it looks like this. And that's true on either side of all of these asymptotes. So I got to figure out which one that is. And in order for me to do that, I need a sign chart. Okay. And I'm going to rewrite my function down here because I can't see it. Um, what was it? X plus three over X times X plus five. Misplaced my paper. Y'all tell me if that's wrong because I don't know what happened to my paper that has it in it. Um, that's correct, right? So then on here, I'm going to put negative 5, negative 3, and 0. Because you have to put your zeros and your asymptotes on here. And then I'm going to do my sign chart. Negative 6. Negative 6 plus 3 is negative. Negative 6 in here is negative. Negative 6 plus 5 is negative. I have three x's. I should have three little signs here. So that is negative overall. If I put in negative 4, that would be negative, negative, positive, which is positive overall. If I put in negative 1, that would be positive, negative, positive, which is negative overall. I put in a positive one, that'd be positive, positive, positive. It's positive overall. Now, this tells me a lot. What I'm concerned with right now are my asymptotes. I know that I have vertical asymptotes at negative five and at zero. And because of this, because this tells me it's negative on this side of the asymptote, I know it looks like that. Positive on this side of the asymptote. Negative on this side, positive on this side. Okay, so given that, there's only certain things that can happen over here. When I come over here, between negative infinity and negative 5, the function is negative the entire time. So the only thing that could possibly happen is something that looks like this. Between negative 5 and negative 3, I'm going to go positive. I have to go through that zero and then it's negative so it would have to look something like this that's the only thing it could possibly do because of the way things work with asymptotes then from zero to infinity the function is positive the entire time it has to hug this asymptote it has to come over here go through that hole and look something like that and there's a graph okay okay so you getting all this We good? What questions you got? Are you going to have to graph this on the AP exam? No. Are you going to be given a function and you have to figure out which graphs it goes with? Yes. So do you have to be able to find all this stuff? Yes, absolutely. All right, any questions? Ooh, um, when I'm done, I'm not stopping for that. All right, so then um, the graph of the rational function is shown above. Write an equation in factored form. So we have the graph and... We are going to do PD Rady. Okay. And we're going to find all this stuff so that we can write our equation. So do I have a hole in this graph? Yes. It is at x equals what? 4? Okay. And I would have to guess at the y value, so I'm not... Gonna, we're just going to go with the x right now. Do you have any zeros or roots? Yes, at x equals what? 3. Do we have any vertical asymptotes? Yes, at x equals 2. Do I have any tangency or togetherness? No, because the function does not bounce off the x-axis, and it doesn't have any togetherness around the asymptotes. So this is none. To worry about that. I have a horizontal asymptote where? At y equals what? Negative 1. Good. Um, I have a y-intercept, but I'd have to guess at what it is, so we're just not even going to worry about it. Okay? There's no guessing on this. 
So I'm going to take all that information and I'm going to write a function. This one is named f. Okay, and I know it's irrational. So here's how I put all this together. I have a point discontinuity or a hole at x equals 4. So I have a factor in the numerator and a factor in the denominator that would be x what? Minus 4. Good. And they would have to match so that I could mark them out, right? So check. Got that part. All right, then I have a root or a zero at x equals 3. Does that go in the numerator or denominator? Numerator, so this would be x minus 3. Check. Vertical asymptote, where does that go? Denominator, and it would be x what? Minus 2. All right, check. I don't have to worry about that. Now, the end behavior, if I have y equals negative 1 as my asymptote, is this top heavy, bottom heavy, or tied in degree? Tied in degree. What I have is tied in degree, so I don't have to add anything in there. It's tied in degree, but would my asymptote be at 1? I'm sorry, would it be at negative 1? No, because it would be at what? 1. All right, so if I wanted it at negative 1 instead of 1, what could I do? Put a negative sign. Boom, there you go. No. It could actually... It can actually be like right out in front of it, but I don't really have room for that. But on the top or the bottom, just don't put it on both and they cancel out. We good on that? What questions you got? All right. So then I have same kind of thing, PD Rady. So let's come up with this. Do I have any holes? Yes, at x equals what? 2. All right. Do I have any roots or zeros? Yes, at x equals 1. How many vertical asymptotes do I have? 2. What's the first one? x equals 0, and then x equals 3. Do I have any tangency or togetherness? No, it does not bounce off the axis, and they don't go in the same direction on either side of an asymptote. Where is my horizontal asymptote at y equals what? Zero. And do I have a y-intercept? No, there's none there. All right, so let me give you a minute. I want you to write an equation for g of x. Bless you. Okay, this one's a little bit more straightforward, right? I got x minus 2 over x minus 2. That gives me the whole. Here's my 0, and here are my two asymptotes. That in behavior, y equals 0. That means my function has to be bottom heavy. This one's bottom heavy, so I'm good, okay? You've used all the information that you have accurately at your disposal. Doesn't mean, again, that that would be the exact graph or exact equation. What questions do you have? We good? All right, so there's a whole other sheet of notes before I'm going to give you your assignment um, that we're going to do tomorrow. But when you go to put this part in your ISN, just you can just put a piece of tape at the top and the bottom, and there it goes. In the time you have left, it would probably be to your benefit to log into Delta Math and do all the Delta Math that you have not done.